Let's dive in. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to, Tammy, I'm actually going to ask you because I can't see you anymore. Um, can you just say yes if you can actually see the slide deck? Can you just say yes, yes. for me? Okay, yes. great. Here we go. Okay, thank you. So this is um, the teen support series, the first of three. And even if you don't make it to the other two, this is kind of a standalone session. They'll kind of be connected, but they're also can can be um, attended just one or just two. So the first thing I wanted to start with is um, the teenage brain. And so this particular session is called, um, is this normal? An exploration of the teenage brain. So I want to start with what our plan is. Um, excuse that little beeping because people are still coming into the room, so that'll maybe be there in the background. Our plan today is to look at three different things. So one is the context that we're raising our youth in. Um, the second is their brains, and that'll be the big chunk of, of the presentation. And then finally, we're going to look at what meaningful support um, can you offer your, your child, uh, whether you're a parent or an educator. Now you'll see I have question marks all over this page and part of the reason for that is um, there's going to be things that I don't know. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's going to be things that the presenter doesn't know and so but I do love questions. And so as we're going, if you have a question, what I ask is that you type it in the chat and every so often I'll pause and check in with Tammy to see if there's any questions in the chat and then she'll kind of share those with me and we'll um, we'll go from there. So please do um, share your questions because that's something that helps um, you know, if you're thinking about the question, there are probably other people in the room who also have the same question. So please ask it if you have it. Let's dive in. So I want to start with sharing a little bit about the philosophical background that we're coming from, because I know there could be a hundred presenters and they could have a hundred different approaches to this topic. Um, I was reading a book the other day. Um, actually, I wasn't reading it. I was in the library and I happened to pick up this book, kind of browse through it. It was called Your Kids Are Your Own Fault. <laughs> What's the name of the book? The ki Your Kids Are Your Own Fault. And that that book was very much about like it was more kind of heavy handed, more <laughs> It was, it was kind of a very different philosophy than the philosophical background that we'll be coming from today. And so I just wanted to put that on the table, that there's these, these two different um, theories that inform what I'm going to be teaching you today. So one is attachment and one is family system. So let me tell you a little bit about both. So attachment theory looks at um, the most important element in relationships is the bond between people. Right, so not as much behavior, not as much um, kind of, you know, the, the nuances of relationship. It's more about the bond and the connection between people. And so in attachment theory, what we're looking at, what we, what we believe is that parents have a natural instinct to know how to move closer to their children. And so we're encouraging parents to kind of do what feels right. With a caveat, and I'll get to that when we get to the brain stuff, um, but that's, that's the idea is that you have a natural um, a built in way to to get close to your children and so do that and it's funny because there's like books on attachment theory but then attachment theory is saying you don't need books so it's kind of funny but um that's that's kind of the the background and it, it comes from some work that was done in the 60s and the 70s um where they looked at how children who had certain kinds of bonding with their parents seemed to grow up to have certain kinds of adult relationships Right? So there seems to be this connection between what happens in your early years with your bonding in your family system and then how you kind of live the rest of your life. So that's one philosophical background that we're pulling from. The other is family systems. And I have a, a spider web here because what family systems talks about is how we're all connected in a family. So there may be parents, there may be children, there may be grandparents, there may be extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, and we're all connected in this web. And so when one part of the web moves, it affects the whole web, right? And so that means that it's not just about the individual person and what they need and what they want. It's also about what's best for the system and what, how is the system functioning? And so the family is almost seen as an organism of itself, right? And how healthy is the organism of the family? So those are the two um, philosophical approaches that will, be, that will be informing what I talk about. The other thing I wanted to show, uh, point your attention to is this little icon in the corner here. 
And so if you lose track of where we are, because I know sometimes these, these talks can be like really interesting and then you can kind of get, well, I know myself, I kind of get lost in the, like, where are we again? Where are we? So if you're not sure which, which of the three things we're talking about, you can just look in the corner here and you'll see that this is the area that we're focusing on in this particular slide. So hopefully that's clear. Hopefully you know what the journey is going to look like. Um, it's about an hour presentation, um, so about 50 minutes now. And like I said, we'll take questions as we go. So type them in the chat as you have them. Let's dive in. So I wanted to start with this idea of exploring the narrative, exploring the narrative. So you'll see two sets of pictures here. You'll see pictures of, of children. And you'll see pictures of perhaps perhaps these are youth and I wanted to just take a minute and think about how is it that we talk about think about our children and so I'm just going to stop sharing the screen for a moment here if I can remember how to do that uh oh okay here we go stop share okay there we go so what I'd like us to do is if you can in the chat write down words that you think of when the word children comes up so when you hear the word child or children what are some of the other words that you associate with child or children can you type those in the chat just type in a, a word or two i'm seeing play innocence fun. oh here they come OK, sorry, Tammy, I couldn't see them because I was not in the right area. But yes, I see that. So I see joy, active, genuine, fun, um, baby, curious, independent, strong willed, sponge, active, laughter, creativity. These are some of the words that we associate with childhood, right? With children and, and childhood happy. What else? What else you got? What are some words that come to mind when you think of children? risk takers yeah okay naive a couple of people said naive yeah funny great innocent resilient it's complicated <laughs> somebody said complicated so needy explorer so if i as i'm speaking these words notice kind of the tone of these words somebody says beautiful um, notice the tone and the feeling around the words that we choose when we describe children Right. Um, and there are some some words like complicated or needy, but look at the other words, unfiltered, free thinking, beautiful. Um, so now what I'm going to ask us to do is kind of switch hats for a minute. Think about words that you associate with teenager. So when you hear the word teenager or teenagers or teens, what other words come to mind? Type those in the chat now. Emotional, intense, attitude, attitude, challenging, stubborn, moody, sensitive, moody, 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 moody. Lots of people are saying moody, stubborn. What else? Smart, uh huh, independent, moody. Interesting, interesting, attitude, illogical, anxious, grumpy. What else? Any others? Challenging. They know best, active, strong willed, unfathomable, condescending, hard to read, lost, intriguing, challenging boundaries. So misunderstood, triggered. Think, think about now the tone that's around these words, self-absorbed, right? Think about the tone and the quality of these words, anxious, rebellious, impressive, sensitive. So isn't that interesting, right? That just from a child changing from 12 to 13 suddenly we have a whole different set of descriptors for that child let's think about that for a moment let's think about that for a moment that as a society we've kind of collectively decided that at this particular point they go from sweet and innocent and happy and fun to moody and anxious and rebellious <laughs> all of those things right so here's the next part of the experiment I want you to think internally now, not in the chat, just since you're in yourself, think about a quality that's important to you. So a quality um, or a value that's important to you. So for example, um, a value that might be important to me is honesty, okay? 
So think about the value that's important to you. Now think about, well, I'll give you a second to do that first. So think about that. Okay, pick a quality. Don't write it down, just kind of keep it for yourself. Now, see if you can remember the first time, the earliest time that you remember becoming aware that that was a value that was important to you. So go right back to the beginning of your life and see if you can remember a time when that value came to the forefront and you became aware that this is something important to you. See if you can do that for a minute. So for me with honesty, for example, um, I remember so clearly when I was in kindergarten, we went on a field trip to the zoo and all of the, the teachers had asked all of the parents because there's these parent groups of like parent would have five kids and another parent would have five, something like that. And they said to the parents, please do not buy any snacks for the kids. Um, we're going to all be having lunch. Everybody's brought their own lunch. Please do not buy snacks. And so I remember being on that field trip and I remember my dad, who was a volunteer, parent volunteer, bought us all ice cream and chips and fries, all of these treats, lollipops. And I remember in that moment feeling the rub of honesty, right? That that's not an honest thing to do because we agreed to do something and now we're doing something else. As a five-year-old, I felt that value of honesty coming up. Okay, so just, that the, just think about in your own life, when, when was the rub? Now, the last part of it is this. Think about yourself as a teenager and ask yourself, did that value carry through? Did that value that you had when you were younger, littler, carry through into your teenage years? And if it did carry through, write a Y in the chat. And if it did not carry through, write an N. So let's see, did those values continue with us into our teenage years? Yes or no, write Y or N in the chat. So somebody, a couple of people said no, more people saying yes. There's about five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, So there's a lot more yeses, almost exclusively. There was a couple of no's, but everybody else is yes, 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 yes. So think about what that means for a moment, okay? Because what we're saying is that we had certain values as children that we then brought with us into our teenage years. I think what happens is that we think about teenagers as some group out there, and we forget that we were once part of that group, right? And what kind of teenagers were we? Like if I think about myself, I was a pretty tame teenager. Like I, um, I was interested in school. I had a couple of volunteering things going on. I had some crushes. Maybe I talked back to my mom once in a while, but overall, I was not that picture that was painted with all of those words that we used, right? And if you think about yourself, if we were all sitting together in a room, there might've been a handful of us that were that person, but most of us would have been very similar to who we were as children, just growing into something else. And so I wanted to start with that, to really get us thinking about culturally how we speak about this time of life and perhaps we want to challenge that as parents and caregivers of youth perhaps we want to say wait a minute wait a minute sure we have these stories about what teens are supposed to be like but when we get to know individual teenagers maybe it's different there's a story so i um i live you know on the lake on a mountain by the lake and every morning I drop my daughter off to the bus stop to go to school. She goes to elementary school and as I'm walking back there's these teenagers that are starting to come to catch their buses for the high school and when I first moved I would kind of get really nervous. There's like huge groups of teenagers just like walking towards me as I'm coming home and we'd kind of just avoid eye contact and, and then one day I realized I said wait a minute wait a minute these are someone's children and Three years ago, they were 10, right? Five years ago, they were 11. So what am I doing? So I actually started making eye contact with the teenagers and smiling, and they smiled back. And so now when I walk to the bus stop to do the drop off, I get to walk back and have all of these smiling young men and women that are connecting with me that way. Now that's kind of a small town thing. I don't recommend, <laughs> and then maybe not every neighborhood you could do that. But the idea is that, you know, going beyond our own assumptions and our own um, stereotypes really about who teenagers are and, and what, um, how they're gonna show up with us if we were to engage with them. 
OK, so that is the context and that's something that that I wanted to have a start to think about that. Hmm, if we if we actually didn't. Didn't assume then these people could have the same values and the same similar personalities as these little people here. Right, so this girl here, maybe we look at her and we think, oh, look, she's collaborative. They're working together. Maybe we would or would not assume that about this group, right? Just because of how they look in our assumptions. So this is the narrative and the word narrative. Is um, it comes from narrative therapy where we look at the stories um, that we tell about our lives and how we how we tell our stories and how what we leave out of our stories, what we magnify in our stories. And so just starting to think in your own family, what is the narrative of the teenage years? Has there been this story about how it's going to be difficult and it's going to be stressful and it's going to be hard? Right. And, and I mean, in the culture, that's what we assume. And yet individual teens are going through a process and I'm going to teach you about what's actually happening with them now. So let's look at the different two different life stages. OK, so this life stage here on the left, that's childhood. And then here we'll get to this later. That's the teen years. So all throughout our life, there's kind of three major things that we need. As humans, as social mammals, there's three things that we need throughout our lives, especially in childhood up until the age of about 11 or 12, 10, 11, 12. So bonding. We need to know that we belong and we're connected and deeply cared for by our people. Right? We need to feel bonded. We need attention. And for those of you with children under five, <laughs> you'll know that if you're not giving attention, they will find a way to get attention, right? It's a human need. Attention, having somebody look at you and see you and understand what, well, maybe not understand, but at least pay attention is a need. They need eyes. They actually need eye contact. Did you know babies, newborn babies, use eye contact to help develop their brains? And when babies look at adults, What's activated in the baby brain is something called mirror neurons, mirror neurons. So the, the brain of the baby says, oh, this is what's normal. So you start the child starts mimicking the adult, right? And you'll see that at certain ages where you can make a face and the baby will make that face back to you. So we need attention. The, the child needs to know that they're seen. And finally, structure. We know that kids need structure and even adults need structure. If you think about a time that you um, didn't have any structure in your life, you know, it can start dissolving into chaos. Even on holidays, we have a little bit of a structure, right? We have a little bit of a routine. We need structure. We need to know kind of what's happening next. Even on a lazy day, you can only have so many of those before it starts feeling like, OK, I got to do something. So I mean, unless you're sick or something else, but generally we need bonding, attention and structure. And that continues, right? That continues on into the teenage years. However, in the teenage years, there's some more things that that are going on for the child, right? Because now it's not just the family. It's not just the safe container of the family that the child is mostly looking for their bonding attention and structure. There's also these other areas that they're drawn to. Right? There's these other kind of spaces that they're drawn to and and this is you know, we're talking today about their brains and what's happening in the brain as as their needs expand. And so here now what they're looking, you know, places that they're looking to form identity is school, right? Friends become really much more important. Um, dating or maybe crushes, depending on how you know savvy your child is. Maybe they're just having crushes or they're dating. Um, they're, they're starting to think about their own interests. So instead of you putting them in that soccer thing, they're deciding what it is that they would like to engage in. Um, and big questions about identity. Who am I? What are my values? What are my beliefs? Who can I trust? Who, who's my, who are my groups and who are not my groups? These are all things that, that they're starting to, to mull over suddenly. Right suddenly, because when when the brain changes, OK, first, yeah, let's go back here. So when the shift happens from three things to all of these things, and sometimes these are competing, right? So sometimes what's happening at school and what's happening with friends are actually going in opposite directions. And so they have to make a lot more choices as they grow. And our job is to provide um, a foundation for them in their childhood and their younger years so that it's easier to make those choices. And if we haven't been able to do that until now, there's still ways we can support them as their brains change. So I want to teach you about this concept. 
If anyone on the call here is a neuroscientist, then just ignore this because you already know it. Um, <laughs> but if you're not, here's some interesting information. So I learned this idea at a conference that I went to to try to make, to, where they were trying to make neuroscience more accessible to parents. And um, so he used this idea of the captain, and I really liked that idea, and I kind of expanded it to create this sort of uh, metaphor to help us understand how the brain works. So we're gonna do another little experiment, and luckily your camera's off so nobody can see you because you might feel a little strange doing this, but I encourage you to join me because it'll help you remember. So take two fingers and tap here in the middle of your head. Let's do it with me. I can't see you, but I can feel it. Are you doing it? Okay, and so what you're going to say is, this is my captain. Say it out loud. This is my captain. This is my captain. Okay, now go to the sides of your eyes here and tap there. Okay, and say, this is my first mate. This is my first mate. This is my first mate. Trust me, the actions will help you remember. Go to the back, back of your head, right under that bump. Tap there and say, this is the sheriff. This is the sheriff. This is the sheriff. Now, what does that mean? This is the captain. This is the first mate. This is the sheriff. Let me explain. The captain is the part of our mind that, a part of our brain that is in charge of the big picture, right? Looking out over the horizon, making long-term plans, making goals, um, problem solving, social engagement, um, thinking about the future, uh, remembering the past and, and bringing um, lessons forward from the past. That's the captain, okay? The frontal cortex is the captain. Then there's the first mate or the amygdala. That part of the brain is just designed to look for danger. It just scans the horizon and looks for danger. That's its job, just to look for danger. That's, all, that's the only thing it's doing. Now, <laughs> that's, that's an older part of the brain than the captain. The first mate has been around longer than the captain has because we needed to know what was dangerous out there, right? So it's a really developed part of our brain, the first mate. And then there's the sheriff. So this is what happens. The first mate scans the horizon and some information comes in. The first mate has to decide is this a life or death situation or not? If it's a life or death situation, the first mate sends the information to the sheriff. The sheriff takes over and makes sure that the organism stays alive. That's its only job is to keep you alive. You might have heard of that as fight or flight, right? That's its job. It keeps you alive. That's it. Or the first mate might send the information to the captain for problem solving. OK, so are you following me so far? So captain, first mate, sheriff. First mate brings the information in, decides where it's going to be sent. Now here's the thing. Are you ready for this? The captain only really starts developing at about 10 years of age. So before 10 years old, children do not really have a captain. There's not enough going on here for the captain to be in charge. There's no captain. And so who's the captain? Well, you're the captain, right? The, the parents, the caregivers, the teachers, that's who's the captain for children under 10. They actually can't think for themselves. They cannot. They don't have the brain capacity. So, so things like um, rhythms and routines, like put away your coat, put away your shoes, put away your coat, put away. Your Are you a parent who just finds yourself repeating that at a certain age? It's because they don't have a captain. So you're the one who's directing them on um, rhythms and routines, on choices, a lot of different things. You're the one who's logical, like right? three-year-olds, not very logical, not very reasonable, because they don't have a captain. So at age 10, when the captain starts developing, what happens to children is they start noticing that what you say and what you do don't always match, right? You say honesty is important to you, and yet you're going behind the teacher's back at the zoo and buying a bunch of treats for the kids. So those don't match, right? And they start forming opinions about their parents. The parents go from la on a pedestal to, oh, you're just people and you've got these flaws. That it's happening in the brain at age 10. Now, here's the other thing. 
because children have a very have already developed the relationship between the first mate and the sheriff in adolescence in the teenage years there's a moment when that relationship becomes really strong so the captain's just starting to wake up just starting to take charge but the sheriff is used to being in charge so sometimes there's kind of a battle between the captain and the sheriff and this is what it looks like ready you know the sheriff is in charge when your teenage daughter is screaming. That's when the sheriff is in charge. You know the sheriff is in charge when your youth is slamming doors or raising their voice or acting uncontrollable. That's the sheriff because what's happened is they've interpreted whatever it is that you're doing as a threat and it's the information has gone to the sheriff. So in the olden days, you know, back when we lived with, amongst nature, the the threat would be a tiger, like basically tiger or lion or some sort of a big predator. That was the danger, snake. Now in modern society, we don't have those dangers, right? But the brain is so used to looking for dangers that it finds dangers. So now, you know those three dots that come up in a text message when somebody's writing to you, but then they don't write anything? Suddenly that's a tiger, right? That eye roll becomes a tiger. That person cutting you off in traffic becomes a tiger. And we go into this fight or flight mode. We go into our, our sheriff where we're ready to fight or we're ready to run away. That is happening as, as your teenagers are growing. That relate that the, the rewiring is starting to happen where the first mate is starting to develop a relationship with the captain, but the sheriff every so often just takes over because it's used to being in charge. I'm going to pause there for a moment because I know that's kind of a big concept and just see um, if there's any questions. So if you have a question about this idea of the captain, the first mate or the sheriff, um, write it in the chat and then Tammy, you can uh, read, read out a question if it comes in. So I'll just give it a moment here. People are still joining. Part of, part of the brain is the sheriff. Yes, yeah, so the sheriff is the brainstem. It's the oldest part of the brain. It's just the survival brain. Good question. Any other questions? Brainstem's job is just to keep your lungs going, keep your heart pumping, just survive, just keep your body upright, like the basics of, of life. Any other questions coming through, Tim? No. OK, so if you have questions, write them in and then at our next question opportunity, um, we can we can read them then even if they're not related, if they're, you know, an older question, that's OK, too. OK, so let's talk a little bit about some of the actual changes that happen in their brain. So we just talked about one, which is that the captain is starting to wake up, starting to form, but it's a kind of um, more than that that happens. So if you think about this picture here on the left, that's childhood. OK, childhood in the brain is like swinging on a hammock in the countryside on a warm summer day. There's not really much going on. It's just in the moment. It's pleasant. That's a child's brain. Just kind of pleasant in the moment. Every so often gets activated. You know, something happens, but generally not much going on in the brain. And then suddenly and sometimes it feels like overnight there's these hormones that get dumped in and I wanted to share this with you because sometimes the thing about like hormones can feel like a, like a catch-all or an excuse but I want to help you see that hormones the way that they flood our children's brains actually profoundly change their brains they do and so what happens is they go from this you know sunny day lying on the hammock to suddenly they're right in the middle of a big, busy, bustling New York City with all of those things flashing and people coming and going like pre-COVID New York City, right? Just crazy busy. And so there's so much more stimulation that they didn't have before. Suddenly they're starting to notice things that they never noticed before, like, like breasts. <laughs> Suddenly for many, you know, many um, straight boys, heterosexual boys, it's like all they see is breasts everywhere they can't, like everywhere they look there's breasts. And before at nine or 10, they weren't noticing that, but suddenly they're noticing these, these things that they didn't notice. They're noticing um, social cues that they didn't notice before. 
So all of these things are happening and suddenly they're flooded. The steps that we take in childhood are simple steps, right? And partly because remember at the beginning, I said there's this thing about your instinct, like parents have an instinct. So we have an instinct to raise our children until the captain starts to form. We are the captain. So nature has given us that instinct of how to soothe our children, how to be with our children, how to guide our children. Simple. But when they have their own captain, and they're living in this very, very stimulating, you know, there's a lot of stimulus in their brain. Now the steps are getting really complicated, right? It's not just do I want to go to, you know, soccer on Mondays or soccer on Tuesdays. It's do I even like soccer? What are my friends doing? What um, is soccer a way of my parents trying to control me? All of these other questions, all of this complexity starts with the teenage brain. It actually shifts in their brain. And I want to go into some specific changes that happen um, in a moment. Ooh. OK, so. Um, back to hormones, so testo sorry, testosterone and vasopressin alter a teenage boy's sense of reality. In a similar fashion, estrogen and oxytocin change the way teenage girls perceive reality. This is really important because girls are driven hormonally to look for emotional connection and relationships. That's what that's what oxytocin, that's what estrogen do is they help you to look for relationship and connection, whereas hormones that the boys are getting at, um, kind of exposed to uh, prime them for aggressive and territorial behaviors. That's how they're they're kind of wired. Now, I know that some of this conversation is gendered um, and there isn't enough research yet on transgendered brains for us to kind of understand what's happening there. But we're just talking about brains that have an estrogen dump or brains that have a testosterone dump. OK, so think of it that way. And also every child is different, right? So your boy or your girl um, may be different um, than what I'm talking about. This is a general like the general findings. Um, and there are exceptions to this, so just kind of keep that in mind. This comes from the male brain, which is a fantastic read for anyone who's trying to understand why their sweet little boy has turned to a bored teenager. Great read. And then there's also the female brain. Why my sweet little girl has changed into a moody, you know, withdrawn, <laughs> angry little person. So these two books are fantastic. And not just it doesn't just talk about the teenagers. It talks about from birth all the way to older age and what's happening hormonally in the brain for for male testosterone brains and estrogen brains. There are differences. There actually are differences. So one of the impacts of this, these different sort of um, what they're perceiving or what they're noticing is <clears throat> girls at this age are going to be very, very concerned about belonging inside the circle. OK, so becoming part of a group or belonging inside a group will become very, very important to girls. And for boys, what becomes very, very important is understanding where they fit on the ladder, on the hierarchy. Now, the skills to get into the circle are different than the skills to get higher on the ladder. They're just different skills. And so their bodies and their brains are working out these different priorities that they didn't even have before. They didn't even really notice before. So how do we support them? <laughs> we know all this things are happening in their brain and there's all of these changes. So how do we support them? Before we go there, I'm going to take another little pause um, and ask you about you know, any of this or you have any questions about changes in the brain. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I won't be able to answer all of the questions on this, but if I can answer it, I definitely will. So I'll just give you a moment here to think about what you want to know about the brain changes that that children experience as they become adolescents. We do have a few more questions on the side. Great. How long is the sheriff in charge? Yeah. OK, so if OK, this is a really good question. The sheriff is actually only in charge for 60 to 90 seconds unless you add more thoughts to the reaction. So when there's a bubbling up of the, you know, the cortisol and the all of the hormones that are involved, the adrenaline, when that bubbles up, it only lasts physically in the body for 60 to 90 seconds. However, most of us don't feel comfortable just feeling our feelings. We have to we have to do something with it, right? <laughs> so fight 
you know, it's often we fight. And how do we fight? It's not necessarily with fists. It's often with words. And so though that kind of physiological impact is only 60 to 90 seconds, once we start adding words and thoughts, it can go on and on and on, right? It can go for hours sometimes, just the fighting or the, or the running away and withdrawing. So it, what we want to teach our children to do and teach ourselves to do is to be able to have the experience of an emotion without being so flooded that we can't come back. Okay, without being so flooded that we can't come back. Let's do a little, um, a little experiment together just to demonstrate this because I like giving people real tools, not just like try this, but here's an actual tool, okay? So this is um, a tool called the Quick Cohesion Technique quick cohesion technique, and it comes out of a, a philosophy called heart math. And what they're doing in heart math is they're teaching people how to regulate their heart so that their physiology stays calm even in the midst of crisis. Okay, so that's heart math. And so let's do it together. So first I want you to think about something in your life that's a little bit a little bit prickly, a little bit irritating, prickly, something around a, a five or six of irritation, not a 10, but like a five or six. Okay, so just kind of bring that to mind and notice how you feel in your body as you think about that thing, right? So as I'm thinking about my little prickly thing, I feel a bit of like pressure in my throat. I feel my eyebrows are kind of wrinkling. You know, my chest is kind of tightening as I'm thinking about this thing, okay? So here you are in the middle of a crisis or a, di a, a discomfort in the body. And now we're gonna do the quick cohesion technique. So the way we do it is very simple. First, you just breathe a little bit more slowly and deeply than you usually would. So just take, do it right now, just test it. Take a couple of deep breaths, just a little bit more slowly and deeply than you usually do. You can keep your eyes open or closed, doesn't really matter. And as you're breathing, as you're taking these deep breaths, bring your focus to your heart, your physical heart. And you might do that by putting a hand there or you might just bring your mind there to your heart. Okay, and now bring to mind a pleasant or enjoyable memory. A time when you were feeling pleasant or you were enjoying yourself, or you're having fun. Just bring that to mind and see if you can kind of re-experience it in your mind as if it's happening right now. So notice now how you feel in the body. If we were all in a room together, I would uh, pick people and say, how is it, how is it, how is it? For most people, just that few deep breaths and that visualizing, you know, a happy event changes our physiology. And so when we're in power struggle with our children, whatever their age is, whether they're in their 20s or their teens or their, you know, little younger toddler days, if we're able to stay regulated, then we come back to our captain. We're not operating from the sheriff because when one person's brain is in sheriff and the other person's brain is also in sheriff, things just escalate and escalate and nothing gets resolved. So as the adults, we have to be the ones who can bring ourselves back to that cohesion, right? To that connection and that calmness and then deal with whatever's happening. You have to stay in captain. You can't get pulled into sheriff when they go into sheriff. Great question. Um, next question, Tammy. So if the captain doesn't start to show up until 10 years of age, how mm -hmm. do you explain teenage behavior that shows up at the age of three? <laughs> yes. Excellent question. So at the age of about two, two and a half, there's actually a testosterone and an estrogen flood that happens in the brain. So girls, little girls get estrogen, little boys get testosterone. And so what happens is little girls become a lot more cuddly around the age of two, two and a half. They want to connect with people. They want to sit on laps. They want to tell you their stories. They want to connect with you. Little boys get more, um, a little bit more competitive. So they want to ride their bike without their training wheels and they want to see who has the bigger, 
whatever some like the pee contest i don't know if you have boys but like, they want to see whose pee goes in what direction in the toilet right like these things start happening so that's why it's it's a little it's like a mini dump that and people i mean people in the field say you see your you see your child at two you'll kind of know what they're going to be like at 17 15 17 so there that's what's happening is they're getting that dump at that age great question Next question. Oh, the other thing about that age is developmentally, what children need to learn at age two and three is who am I away from my parents? When the, my parents are not around, who am I? And so there's a push away that happens at two or three that is very similar than, as the push away that happens at 13, 14 and on. And we'll talk about that in our next session, that push away. Any other next questions? We have a comment from MJ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. agreed that the stimulation factor and that they have difficulty recognizing their assumptions um, mm -hmm. that lead to their decisions. Yep, they do because they get very, very narrowly focused, very narrowly focused. And we'll talk a little bit about that next time that why, you know, what's that, what's happening there? What's that change? So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll save the rest of the questions until we do a couple more slides, if that's okay. Um, actually, let's take one more, Tammy. Do you have another one? No, that was all. That was it. Okay. So keep keep writing these. These are great questions. Thank you for, for offering these questions. So now the third part. So we've talked about, you know, the context. We've talked about their brains. And now we're moving into the third part, which is how do you support them? Right? And and that's a question that kind of like I kind of heard that in some of the questions you were asking is like, how long does the sheriff last? What am I supposed to do while they're going crazy? Like those, are, you know, how do we support them? So you'll see two images here on the left. This is the image that often, you know, is often fed to teenagers about what the teenagers are going to be like, that you're going to be on this path. You're going to be carrying these loads. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to make all these, you know, big decisions and choices and you're planning for your future. And this is what what many teens think they're walking into. Right. And, and if you notice, there's actually really no room for parents here. The teens kind of on their own to figure it out. Maybe with their peers. But that's actually not meaning that's that's we can think of the teenage years again in a different way. So what if we were to think of it as this way here, where here's your child as they are today and in the future, that's that's their future self. That's the adult that your child is evolving into. Because the thing about the teenage years that we've got wrong is that teenage years are not a separate stage in themselves. There's only really two developmental stages. There's childhood and there's adulthood. There's only two. So what the teenage years are, <clears throat> the youth is the movement from here to here. That that passage in the middle, that's what the teenage years are. And we'll talk more, I'll get more into that in our next session about how to help navigate them on that journey of the middle, that transitional period. So this pathway, this is the teenage years, but what the goal is, is to become an adult, right? To become a, a, a kind of, a, an adult that can function in society, an adult who knows, you know, who feels good about who they are, who has some direction, who feels grounded. That's what we're moving towards. Now on this journey, it's not straight. It's not a straight path. There's bumps and turns and twists. And sometimes it feels like you're going backwards and sometimes it feels like you're going off the path, but it's, it is a movement to becoming their, their older self. And where we fit in as parents and caregivers and teachers is that we are the signposts along the way. So the first thing we have to be able to establish with our children, our teens, is trust. Trust is the foundation. And many teens talk to my therapists who work with, I don't work with teenagers, but I have therapists who do, and they say, my parents don't trust me. And it really hurts them because these are kids who are pretty good kids, but they're getting the, the message from their parents that they can't be trusted just because they turned 15 or whatever age, or just because they started doing this particular thing. Now the parents are like, oh no, they're so trust is really, really important. And I want to give you a resource here. There's um, a video by Brene Brown called The Anatomy of Trust. It's on YouTube. You can just, you know, search it on YouTube, The Anatomy of Trust. And what she does in that video, and she does it really well, and that's why I didn't do it here because she does it way better than I could. She breaks down trust into these different components. And so when we're talking about trust, she actually says, well, what are we talking about? Are we talking about boundaries? Are we talking about reliability? Are we talking about accountability? 
right? And so she has these different components of trust. And so when you understand the compl those complex pieces, then you can have a different kind of conversation with your child, right? Then you can say, well, you're not being very reliable rather than I don't trust you. So check that out. If trust is something that you're kind of, you know, is kind of sticky for you in your family, check out that, that video, Anatomy of Trust by Brene Brown. The next is support, but support when you're asked, right? And, and here's the thing, right? Here's the thing that teenagers will want to talk to you at the most inconvenient time. Like you are ready to go to bed, <laughs> you've had enough, and that's when they want to have a sit down little chat. And the thing is, their circadian rhythms, the sleep cycles of teenagers is different than the sleep cycles of children or adults in that they tend to be more awake later into the night. It's just kind of what's happening in their brain. And so, and it's harder for them to get up in the morning. And, you know, I, I wish we could like present to, you know, the powers that be to say, let's start school a little bit later for teenagers because they just can't wake up. Like they actually can't, their brain does not turn on until much later in the day um, compared to when they were children or when they'll become adults. So the support will be sometimes required of you when you're sleepy. <laughs> so just show up, drop everything, show up, be there. Um, other way, and you can actually ask them, you know, how can I support you? And they might say, I don't know. And then you might say, okay, well, think about it. And if you think of anything, let me know. Let me know how I could support you in this. Rather than saying, can I drive you? Can I do this? Why don't I do this? Why don't I? So what you're starting to do is letting them problem solve on their own and teaching them how to ask for help. There are so many adults in our cohort who have no idea how to ask for help. They just do everything on their own and then they burn out, right? So we want to equip our children to be able to ask for help, but you have to be available and let them think through what is it that they need, right? What is it that they need? So that support. Presence is really important. They can tell when you're not with them. And the number one culprit of lack of presence is this thing right here. Number one culprit is this thing right here. Um, you know, some families have... Uh, a bowl on the table so when you're sitting down to dinner everybody puts their phone in the bowl right um there has to be some times in the household where nobody's where people are present which means they're not distracted by something else which is usually a phone and you as the parent as best as you can cultivate presence in yourself there's a difference between and I've, it's so incredible I, i'm looking forward to studies on this one day hopefully um reading a book if you're sitting on your couch and you're reading a book, your child still feels like they can come and interrupt you and talk to you. Whereas if you're sitting on the couch on your phone, there's some sort of this barrier that happens where they feel like either irritated that you're not paying attention to them or that you, they, that you can't be disturbed. So just be mindful. How present are you in the household? Right? Are you kind of run in a million directions and so you're not really there? You're not, your mind is not really there for them. And if that's the case, well, I'll get to that, like how, how, how to help yourself. And then finally, guidance, right? They will come to you for guidance if these other three things are in place, the trust, the support, and the presence. Then they'll naturally come to you for your guidance. Otherwise, it feels like you're telling them what to do, and you don't know this path. Only they know what the path looks like for them. So that's how we support our kids. And like I said, we also have to make sure that you're supporting yourself because if you're a mess, you're not going to be available to do, to be your best version of your parenting self, right? You just won't. So making sure that you have the support that you need, you have um, breaks in your life, <laughs> even if it's just a little coffee break, right? Or a little tea break in the day that you're giving yourself windows of time that are for you, that are for you to recharge yourself, for you to have energy. Because if your tank is empty, you have nothing to give them. So it's really important that, that we as adults take responsibility for keeping our own tank full. Very important. And I know sometimes it can feel a bit like um, unnecessary or, um, you know, like not that important. But what I found as a therapist is that when people are under stress, the first things to go are usually the things that were keeping their stress low. So the first things to go are things like, um, you know, spending that time with those those people that they enjoy being with or, you know, going to the gym or eating nutritious food because, you know, it's easier to just pick up something through the drive through window. So the things that were keeping us stress free, we get rid of them and then we wonder why we're stressed. So really important for yourself to have a plan of how are you going to support yourself through this period of life because you will need support. The other way to support yourself is to look for um 
families that are kind of emulating what you what you're wanting for your family, right? So like mentors, rather than comparing ourselves and saying, oh my gosh, I'm such a bad parent, looking around and saying, who's doing it the way, who has kids that I like? Like, which kids around me do I actually find very pleasant? And then building re re community with their parents, right? So you can kind of be um, like in informally coached. We can informally coach each other. This works for me. This works for me. And we do that when our kids are little, right? We do that when the kids are potty training and we'll talk about, you know, how are you doing? What are you doing? Suddenly when they become teenagers, we stop talking about it. And so uh, like giving ourselves permission to have that community of support around us and checking with other parents. How does it work for you? I want to end with this is do I want to end? Hold on, let me check. Do I, yes, I do want to end. OK, so <laughs> sometimes I can't remember what's on the slide. So I want to end with this really, really important um, message. Self-regulation, us regulating ourselves as adults is the best thing we can do for our teenagers. So when they come to you with something, especially if it's something prickly, there's three steps that I would recommend that you take before you respond. So the first is review. What is it that they've actually said to you? And what is it that perhaps they don't have the words to say to you, but they're trying to say to you? So for example, they might be saying, oh, it's so annoying. Like you're just always on your phone, right? So that's what they might be saying. You don't let me use my phone, but you always get to use your phone. Like those, <laughs> can you tell I've been around some teenagers? So that might be what they're saying. But what they're really perhaps saying is, I miss you, but they would never say that, right? To say you're always busy, but what they're really saying is I miss you. So take all the evidence, collect all the words and all the body gestures and the languages and review what's in front of you. Look, really look at what are they saying and what are they asking right now? What are they trying to communicate right now? Review. The second thing is to reflect, to say, okay, how is this ask affecting me? Because for many of us, we'll say, well, I would have never talked to my parents like that, or I would have never expected that at that age or whatever. So our own baggage from our own past sometimes comes up when we're parenting. So we have to look at that and say, OK, this is not about me. <laughs> my childhood is over. My teenage years are gone. This is about a next generation living in a completely different context, right? When when you and I were going to school as teenagers, well, maybe not everyone in the room, but at least for me, there was no social media and nobody had a phone. So I could make all kinds of goof ups and nobody captured that on video, right? Nothing was posted online forever for the whole world to see. I didn't have that problem. But so the, the, so reflecting on, you know, the times that we grew up in are different and what is it that I can do here? Right? What is it that I can actually do here or what what um, if I put aside my own stuff? OK, so review, look at all the evidence, reflect. What's it bringing up for me? And also when you're doing the reflecting, am I acting like a two year old right now myself? <laughs> am I acting like a grumpy eight year old myself? Or can I be an adult, right? Growing yourself up, doing that breathing, bringing yourself back. And then finally responding. And I use this picture because this is the exact thing not to do. Do not get up on your high horse and your podium and lecture them because they won't hear you. Right, you'll just be like wah, 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 wah. respond. See what they've said, how you're digesting it, how it's affecting you, and then respond to not only what they said, but what they what they were maybe trying to say as well. So letting go of having to be the boss or in charge during these conversations to actually be curious what's really going on here. So that's what I would recommend as you're getting into some of these stickier places with our our youth. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, Tammy. I'm wondering if there's any questions um, about any of what we've talked about. There is a comment. Okay. Modeling and self modeling self care, sorry, and breaks is a good strategy to help them see the importance of it, if not for now, at some point in their lives. Exactly, because you're teaching them what it feels like to be an adult. And, you know, when my son was about 11 years old, one day he walked into the room and he was so upset, so upset to the point of tears. And I said, you know, what's going on? What's the problem? And he said, you know, I don't want to grow up. And I said, why? And he said, well, because when I grow up, then I'm going to have to have a job and I'm going to be stressed all the time and I'm never going to have any fun. And all I'm going to do is complain about my job and it's going to be so hard. And I thought, uh oh, 
uh oh, that's what he's seeing us do right now. That's a problem, right? My husband and I were like, uh oh, we don't want to be those pair, those adults that are always complaining. So we actually had to do kind of a, a reset in our family to say, OK, if we're going to choose these jobs, then we're going to also choose to do them wholeheartedly. Right. My husband's an IT guy, and so sometimes he's like up in the middle of the night doing changes and whatever. I'm like, if this is the profession you choose, do it wholeheartedly, because if you're just complaining and stressed, that's what our kids are learning that adulthood looks like. Great comment. Any other comments or questions? Tell me before we close. Can you please repeat the names of the books you mentioned? Yes. The male brain and the female brain. Is it the same author for both? Same author, yes. So the author's name is Luan Brizendine. Maybe I'll just stop sharing my screen and type this in the chat. If I can figure out how I'm to do trying that. to be here by Luan. Okay, so Luan, L-O-U-A-N-N. And then the last name is Brizendine, B-R-I-Z-E-N-D-I-N-E. -E. So the male brain, the female brain, pretty simple. You can get them on Amazon. Yeah, uh, someone else's comment, all behavior has meaning. Absolutely, yes. So can you look through the behavior to what's happening underneath? This has been really fun. Um, I know we're kind of at time, so Tammy, maybe if we can just close out and tell them how to connect for the next one. Sure, we have a couple more questions dribbling in there. Are you okay. able to see Heather's question? Sure, I'll do Heather's. Yes, I'll do Heather's question. So she says, I can see the chat now. So she says, my son has his license, but is currently not a safe driver. So we do not let him drive on his own. He thinks we don't trust him. How do we explain we do trust him? We are just concerned for his and others' safety. Watch that Brene Brown anatomy of trust video and see if you can figure out which component of trust is problematic. Which component of trust is problematic for you? And I think the component of trust that may be problematic is boundaries. You're trying to set a boundary with him and he's not respecting the boundary, right? That you you actually don't feel like he's safe on the road. You're protecting <laughs> protecting the other drivers. And that's how you, you say, you know, you're new at this and so much can happen on the road. And right now we don't feel comfortable. Not that we don't trust you. We just don't feel comfortable with you being on the road without an adult in the car for now. And the more you practice, you know, let's practice, 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 and you'll get there where we are comfortable with it. Right? So something to that effect where you're explaining to him your reasons without necessarily putting him down. That might be one way to do it. I think that's that's all the questions. So let's sign off there. We'll Thank you back. so much. That was a very engaging session. I'm sure everyone um, took away a nugget. I'm wondering for the next session if we could consider as well some of the impacts that we've seen as a result of the pandemic. And so we're when you talk about the importance of bonding, not just with family, but with peers at this critical developmental stage mm -hmm. and how the pandemic has impacted yeah. that in negative ways for our kids and what we can do as parents and educators to address that. You know, that's actually one of the main themes of the next one is about peer orientation and how we navigate that space. So yes, we'll, we'll bring that up as awesome. well. Thank you. Thank Great. you so Thanks, much. Thanks everyone. We'll Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming Hi. everyone. Um, can you just say something about the video recording? A few people have asked about that. Yes, so I have recorded it and I will share the link with each of the school administrators so that they can in turn share it with you. Great. And the next session is on May 18th. So hopefully we see you there. Bye everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.